Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Generational Wrestling Podcast. As always, it's yours truly, the 27-year-old piece of gold, the franchise, aka the showstopper, better known as the G.O.W.'s resident tribal chief. With me, as always, I got my tag team partner, my brother, my family. He is the flyest in the room, Mr. One, Two, Three. Pin that ass down, K. Breezy, aka Tuco Kimber in the building, bro. How you doing? Man, I'm good, man. I'm excited about today, man. We've been we've been talking about it all week, man. So I'm excited, man. Can't wait to get started. Well, let's do it. With, any, with no further ado, man, introducing our guest. You may know him from his podcast or his YouTube channel, Insight with Chris Van Vliet, or like me, you might know him from his time here as a personality in Cleveland's WOIO Channel 19. He has interviewed some of the biggest and brightest stars in Hollywood and professional wrestling, including but not limited to John Cena, The Rock, Dave Batista, Will Smith, Tina Fey, and many more. Ladies and gentlemen, help me introduce CVV, Chris Van Vliet. How are you doing, brother? Gentlemen, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for this beautiful background that you've created here. Oh, my God. I feel like a real guest. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, 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 with that being said, how is it being on the other side of the mic, man? Because I know you're usually the one asking the questions. Now we're asking you the questions. How is it, man? How, how does it feel? Yeah, it's always a little bit scary when I, I'm a not in control, right? When I'm asking the questions, <laughs> I'm the one in control. I know exactly what we're going to talk about here. Uh, you know, it's like what what could happen anything could happen here but it, you know it's really interesting being an interviewer for my whole career you know i've been i've worked in broadcasting since 2005 i think it's helped me to become a better interviewer because i know what makes for a good interview now i'm not saying i'm a great interview by any means i'm just <laughs> saying that i'm definitely more cognizant of what's going on in these conversations now well, I can truly say, man, we definitely appreciate it. We look forward to having a good time. The tagline of the show is real talk for real fans, man. So we're just going to be honest, have a little fun, nothing too serious. Uh, uh, but with that being said, let's start it off. So, Chris, uh, I know that you're a native of Canada. What part of Canada did you grow up in? And what was life like for you as a kid? Yeah, just outside of Toronto, my hometown is called Pickering, Ontario. It's actually, I went to the same high school as Sean Mendez, or I should say Sean Mendez went to the same high school as me <laughs> because I was obviously there first. But yeah, it was great growing up in Canada. Obviously played a lot of sports. Hockey's a huge thing when you grow up in Canada. But I played hockey and baseball growing up. I was on the high school wrestling team and super competitive. I was a super competitive kid growing up. And I think that that's helped me a lot in my broadcasting career. That also helped me a lot because I played a ton of sports and I'm sure you guys know the story because I've told it many times, but I wanted to be a pro wrestler. I went to wrestling yes. school when I was 20, took the bumps, ran the ropes, did everything. And, you know, it was kind of at a crossroads because I did it in the summer while I was at college and kind of had to decide when college picked back up that fall. Do I want to continue with wrestling school and pursue that dream? Or do I want to continue with school school, get my degree in broadcasting and figure things out? And I decided let's continue with school, school and wrestling would always be there. And yeah, now I'm really fortunate guys that I'm able to like do my broadcasting career, which I'm super passionate about and, you know, dip my toe into the wrestling world every once in a while. Right. Well, being as that person who, who loves this sport of wrestling, uh, who was that person? Who was that wrestler for you that, 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 that brought you that attention, that love that you have for it? It was The Rock. I mean, you know, when <laughs> when you grew up watching in the Attitude Era, you know, it's kind of like right before that, it was a, you're either a Sean or a Brett guy. And I think that a few years right. after that, oh, what's up, Anthony? This is so cool. This is so cool to be <laughs> talking to everyone here. For me, it was The Rock. And I was such a big Rock fan that <laughs> I would walk around my high school asking people questions just so I could shout, it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> <at them. laughs> I dressed up as The Rock for Halloween one year. I mean, my favorite match of all time is, uh, you know, I got the poster right here, WrestleMania 18, Rock Hogan, like Rock's the guy for me. And, you know, they always say that you shouldn't meet your heroes and franchise you mentioned, you know, I've, I've interviewed The Rock, you know, nine times, not that I'm counting or anything. <laughs> um, they always say you shouldn't meet your heroes, but if your hero happens to be Dwayne Johnson, I encourage you to do whatever you can to try to meet your hero because- absolutely. He is kind and he's nice and he's funny and he's charismatic and he makes you feel really special, even though he's the biggest celebrity in the world. So, yeah, Rock's my guy. And, uh, you know, I will be raising the people's eyebrow forever. <laughs> I, I, I can re definitely respect that uh, franchise. Well, sp well, speaking of The Rock, um, you talk about, you know, you don't want to meet your idols. Well, The Rock is, of course, one of my idols. As I'm pretty sure he's, uh, if you know anything about wrestling, I'm pretty sure he's in your top. Two, in my opinion. But 
with you also having a background interviewing, you know, Hollywood stars outside of pro wrestling, uh, what is your favorite all time interview? I'm gonna give you a two parter here. What's your favorite all time interviewer in Hollywood? And who is your favorite all time interview as far as professional wrestling aside from The Rock? Like, who is unexpectedly a cool person to talk to that you're like, mm, I didn't see that one coming? Hmm. It's tough because it's like trying to pick your favorite child, right? You know, <laughs> every every interview has been special for some sort of reason or memorable for some sort of reason. But Rock was at the top of my list. So I'll, I'll put Rock in the wrestling category as being my favorite because Rock meant so much to me as I just talked about growing up. And I got Rock backstage at Raw for my first interview. So, you know, I've interviewed wow. The Rock a ton of times for a bunch of different movies that he's done. Fast and Furious, right. Rampage, Central Intelligence, you know, many right. different films. But the first time I interviewed The Rock was backstage at Raw as he was preparing for his WrestleMania 28 match with John Cena. So the fact that I got The Rock in the setting that I grew up watching The Rock in was so cool. And we were waiting in this room. This was in Cleveland. This was at the queue. We were waiting for uh, The Rock to come into this room. We were in this, this like holding room and I was there with a few other reporters. We're all like jacked up and excited. We're about to talk to The Rock. This is so cool. And this is, man, we're going back. This is like 2011, I think, when I did that first interview. And The Rock walks in and you can feel his energy just fill up the room. And he shook everybody's hand. He didn't know who was the interviewer, who was the cameraman, who was the publicist, who was anybody. Right. Hello, how are you? Good to meet you. I'm Dwayne. Good to meet you. I'm Dwayne. Good to meet you. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then after the interview, he took photos with all of us, signed any autograph that we wanted. Like that was so cool and so unexpected and did not need to happen. So Rock's definitely the wrestling interview for me. Although I guess he's, you know, biggest star in the world now. So he could also right. be a Hollywood right. guy. But after I interviewed The Rock, the next on my list was Tom Cruise. And I have such a respect for the way that Tom Cruise performs in his films. And you know, I just think that he's the last remaining like movie star. Like that guy's been a movie star since the 80s. Yeah. And when I got to interview Tom Cruise, it was just the setting was so cool. I got him for the last Mission Impossible movie. It was in Paris, it was on the red carpet for the world premiere of this film. The Eiffel Tower was behind us. And I got to have this great conversation with Tom Cruise, who I've looked up to for, you know, my whole life and, you know, I think his whole career. So I've got this great photo of me and Tom Cruise, Eiffel Tower behind us. And I don't know if it gets much better than that. And he was so <laughs> gracious. He looks you right in the eye when he talks to you, makes you feel like you're so special. And it's something that I'll never forget. And also something that I try to apply when I talk to people you know, in my everyday life. Well, you say Tom Cruise and, and The Rock were your, your best. One of our fans who uh, wasn't able to be with us live, he wanted to ask a question of who was your most difficult or who was the person you thought to be the most difficult, but realized, you know, they really weren't, you know, as bad as they were or, or who was your most difficult interviewer? Well, I think that if you watch the interview I tried to do with MJF, you'll, uh, <laughs> You'll yeah. see pretty quickly. <laughs> He's just a terrible human. So, uh, yeah, that, that's that one. That was, I was not expecting. I didn't know what to expect. I knew that he's, you know, just a, yeah, he's a difficult man. I didn't know what to expect. And uh, what happened happened. So, probably MJF. Although I will say, for the most part, and I've been really fortunate over my career to interview all kinds of great actors and celebrities and directors, authors, comedians, whatever. I think that when there's a camera in front of you and you know you're being recorded, I think that people, for the most part, put on their best face. So you're not gonna get like a terrible moment. Right. But you know, if you go through my YouTube channel, there's definitely been some <laughs> moments that have gone off the rails a little bit, yeah. Oh, this is Daryl. This is so nice. Well, these are such nice comments, man. <laughs> hey, man. All baby you know, faces in the comments here. <laughs> hey, hey, this is, these are the GOW, man. We appreciate them, man. They show. Well, so you much guys do stuff. such great work, and I'm honored to be on the show. So, thank you. Thank you. We're, we're, we're trying. We're, we're slowly climbing to your level, man. We're, we're trying to get there. We we're gonna you know, try to get our first interview with the Rock. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see if you if you can get your first interview before I get my tenth interview. Let's we'll, we'll race to to that number. Hey, let's, all right. do let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> 
Well, so I want to talk to you because uh, you did say that, you know, your first interview with The Rock was here in Cleveland. So I want to talk to you about your time you spent with WOIO, yeah. 19 Action News, and the special interviews you did there. How did that come about? Oh, man, I loved my time in Cleveland, and Cleveland is such a special place in my heart. Um, so I was working in Toronto right before that. I was 26 at the time. I was hosting a show in Toronto called Inside Jam on a station called Sun TV. It was fun. I was interviewing all kinds of celebrities. I uh, would travel and do a lot of interviews. I covered the Toronto International Film Festival, which is one of the biggest film festivals in the world. And my agent said, how would you feel about being an entertainment reporter in Cleveland? And it was, the timing was perfect because the summer before, I had been in Cleveland to watch a baseball game with my dad. My dad and I have this tradition that we go to a different Major League Baseball stadium every single year. So the year before, we went to Progressive Field. We saw a game. We stayed in downtown Cleveland, went to the Rock Hall. I love, I love calling it the Rock Hall because people that aren't from Cleveland are like, what are you talking about? The right. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah. right. And we enjoyed everything that Cleveland had to offer. And then here we are, I think it was like five months later, four months later, my agent said, how would you feel about being an entertainment reporter in Cleveland? And I said, it's, I, I loved my time there. Like there's such an energy in that city. So I auditioned for the job and I got it. And Fast forward through all the legal steps we had to take for a Canadian to work <laughs> in your fine country of America, which I <laughs> now call home. I started, this was in 2010, I started uh, on CBS 19, uh, WOIO, and I was hosting a segment called The Buzz, which was super fun. And got to like my fourth day of work, I was at the Oscars. I was on the Oscars red carpet. Like I had such a great time there, was able to do so many incredible things. But most importantly, I met so many awesome people there. And I am still, it was tough for a long time, but I am still a Cleveland Browns fan. And last uh, season gave me some real hope yes. that this season we'll have a legit playoff run. <laughs> yes, uh, sir. Most, uh, we most definitely will. Uh, your time here, it, it brought you a lot of acclaim. Uh, you won sports awards here. Uh, but one thing, you know, a lot of people really talk about is, you, you know, you're you're somebody who looks forever young. and and, and I'm sure, you know, when when you got to Cleveland and you were the, what I believe it was the 2011 uh, Cosmopol uh, Cosmopolitan Bachelor of the Year. And I, how was that for you to come to Cleveland and you to be, you know, received with, you know, such warmth and that, that you're the most available guy and you're doing all the, you're winning these awards, you're doing all this other stuff and you're fishing. And what was, I, I, I know you said you, it, you, uh, you enjoyed it and it was your, you know, fun time, but what was it really like for you during that moment when, you know, you were uh, making the news for that? The Cosmopolitan Bachelor of the Year thing came as a massive surprise. Okay. So if I take it back a little bit, which I don't think is talked about as much, but like I was like six weeks into Cleveland and my boss said, Inside Edition is coming to town and they're doing this like most eligible bachelors in Cleveland thing. We're going to put you on the show. And I'm like, what? And I just moved to Cleveland. Hello, Teresa. I, I just moved to Cleveland. I was enjoying all of the amazing food that you have there. Like, oh my God. <laughs> Winking Lizard, Melt Bar and Grilled. Like I was enjoying all of the food that Cleveland had to offer, Slimans. And then they're like, all right, so like in two days from now, you have to like take your shirt off for this photo shoot. I'm like, <laughs> what? I'm not ready for this. And I was, I, was, I mean, it was not you made it to the big, You're in the big times now. Right. And I was like, I'm not ready for this. And I did whatever I could in those 48 hours to like, try to like lose a little bit of the, you know, chicken wings that were on my stomach. <laughs> so that was, that was, um, right when I first moved to Cleveland and about a year later, got a random phone call from Cosmopolitan magazine. And they said, one of your coworkers nominated you for our bachelor of the year contest. And I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> what are you even talking about? And they said, we pick one person from each state and you represent your state. And then the readers of the magazine will vote. And one person will be the bachelor of the year and you'll win $10,000. And I went, oh my God, I can't even believe we're having this conversation right now. This is crazy. I said, but if I win those $10,000, I'm going to donate it to the Boys and Girls Clubs of Cleveland. And they said, oh, wow, that's that's very kind of you. And I said, yeah, it's a nice gesture, but there's no way I'm going to win this thing. <laughs> So fast forward, we did a photo shoot on the beach. Everybody else flew to Los Angeles and did a photo shoot on the beach, like the actual like ocean. Right. And my boss at WOIO is like, we want to be able to control these photos. We don't want photos out there. You're, you know, you're an entertainment reporter. We, want, we don't want photos out there that we don't like. So 
right. we're going to take them here. So I took them. <laughs> if you see those photos, it looks like I'm on the beach and I am on a beach. I'm on the beach of Lake Erie. Uh, yeah, I was, in, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was just out. I was like 10 minutes away from downtown Cleveland and we did yeah. a photo shoot there. And yeah, I mean, I ended up winning the thing. I ended up donating $10,000 to the Boys and Girls Club. The smile on their face when I brought this huge novelty check and signed it over to them was amazing. So yeah, it was a, it's a, it's a something I'm very proud of. I'm very proud that I was able to donate to the Boys and Girls Club. I was right. proud that I got into shape and didn't embarrass myself on Cosmopolitan <laughs> Magazine. But it's funny. That was 10 years ago this year that I did that, which is so crazy to me to think of. But it's right. something that, you know, I'll always have. And, you know, it's a, it's a funny little line on my Wikipedia page or, you know, resume that I'll always have. Right. I, I, thought, it was one of those, I, I thought it was one of those crazy things like, wow, this man has won a lot of sports awards, best host, you know, best story, uh, which, you know, great job. And, you know, and it's Thank like uh, that, that was the one thing to see, like, wow, bachelor of the year. Like, wow, didn't even. <laughs> OK, all right. I got to I got to bring that up just to, just, you know, see what the story is about. But rightfully no, so. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Chris, we're going to go to one of our fans here. Daniel Miller says, hey, Chris, what happened to you work with AEW? Now, was that ever something that was supposed to be a long term thing or what kind of or was it nothing at all? Was it just, you know, you just did a quick one off with them? How did that come about? Well, I was asked to be part of the first episode of Dynamite, which as a huge wrestling fan, my goodness, what an honor that was to be a tiny little minuscule part <laughs> of the first wrestling show on TNT in almost 20 years. So. When they reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested in being part of that first show, October 2nd in Washington, DC, I mean, how could I possibly say no to that? So yeah, I said yes, went in, did that really fun segment with uh, Kevin Smith and Jason Mewes, yeah. and I thought that was it. I thought that was gonna be it, and they ended up calling me up a few weeks later. Like, they called me up on a Monday and basically said, are you free tomorrow? Can you make it to Charleston, West Virginia? And I'm like, I, yes, yes, of course, yes. And that next morning, I drove to Charleston, West Virginia, and was part of that next episode where I did a segment with the Rock and Roll Express. So, you know, I was only expecting to be part of one episode and ended right. up being part of two episodes. And look, there's a lot of people that are in that role. They have a lot of people filling that backstage interviewer role. They don't need me in that role, especially now with everything that's going on with COVID. So, yeah, I'm honored that I was able to do it. If there was an opportunity to do it again, hell yeah, I would do it again. But um, that was exactly what I thought it would be. And man, again, so incredibly grateful for that opportunity to be part of that show. Speaking of AEW, what are your thoughts on the whole uh, integration of New Japan, uh, NWA, Impact? Just the, you know, you know, that forbidden door that we, you know, has always been talked about in rest. What are your thoughts on it, man? And do you like it or or you're against it? And do you wonder or, or I'm saying, uh, do you do you kind of have a feeling of when WWE may cross that threshold? I think it's exciting. I think it's super exciting. And that door is only forbidden for WWE. Everybody else has done these crossover <laughs> shows for years. Although, right. I guess with that said, if we take it way back to the 90s, a, uh, ECW did you know some sort of collaboration with WWE. Right. I think it's, ex it's exciting for fans. It's also exciting for wrestlers. I mean, it's an opportunity for them to be showcased to a new audience. I think there's a lot of people in America that don't really know any new Japan stars. I think yeah. there's unfortunately a lot of people that have lapsed on impact wrestling. And you know, I was a huge TNA fan. Oh, yeah. six, oh, seven, oh, eight, oh, nine, you know, massive AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, Christopher Daniels fan. And I think there's a lot of people that lapsed on impact wrestling. And I think that this is an opportunity to shine a light on all those different places. Look, rising tides lift all boats. Right. And I think that if AEW is that rising tide and they're going to bring along all these other companies with them, I mean, I think that that's just going to make everything that much better for wrestling in general. Now, speaking of wrestling, we all know Canada, besides hockey, is very, very big on wrestling. With you being a native Canadian, now here, you know, you lived in the States for a while. How would you compare the wrestling scene in Canada as compared to, you know, here in the States? There's some of the, I mean, think about it. Some of the best wrestlers of all time yeah. have come out of Canada. So it's yes. a great wrestling scene in Canada. I was really fortunate before moving to the U.S. to work as a ring announcer for a bunch of different companies. But I mean, if we look at the top, like 
Bret Hart, Owen Hart, Chris Benoit, Chris Jericho, Edge, Christian. Yes. You know, the list goes on and on and on and on. There's so many great Canadians who have yes. wrestled. I, I, I just look, I know I missed a whole bunch of people. I'm not saying that they're not good. <laughs> Right, but, right. You know, kind of amazing Canadian Trish Stratus and Ethan yes. Page and Josh Alexander, you know, S Sean Spears. There's so much Tyler Breeze, like, like, like literally just keep going on. So the wrestling scene in Canada is very good and very strong. And I'm yeah, really fortunate to be able to spend some time there, both as a fan and also as a ring announcer and, you know, doing some shows with them. Now, how, how was your transition? You know, living obviously in Canada and now you're here in the States. What was that transition like for you, especially coming here as an adult as opposed to being a child or a teenager? What was that like for you? How long did it take you to get acclimated uh, to everything as far as even t-shirt sizes or, you know, our measurements and, you know, money? How how long did it really take you to get comfortable? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Here? But when you grow up in Canada, like the U.S. is right there, right? It's like right there. And we would take so many vacations to the U.S. Like, we would drive to Buffalo or to Watertown, New York, like upstate New York. Right. Because stuff in the US is so much cheaper than it is in Canada. <laughs> like I remember when the iPhone first came out in 2007, my roommate Adam really wanted one. And we drove down for like an hour. We drove two hours to Buffalo, to the mall. We we got the iPhone and then we drove back across the border because he wanted it that badly. Like that's kind of what you do when you grow up uh, in Canada and you know the, the US is right there. So very, I was very familiar with the US. I had traveled to California and Florida and New York and a whole bunch of other different places. But it was always my goal in my career to move to the US because I knew there was so much more opportunity here. And Leo, I love Cheesecake Factory so much. <laughs> that brown bread, oh, bring me like five loaves when I sit down, jeez. <laughs> But yeah, the, I think the thing that really you know took the uh, getting used to when I moved to the U.S. was you have so many incredible food options here, and that's not to say there isn't great food in Toronto. And I also lived in Vancouver. It's not to say there isn't great food in Canada, but right. when you move to the U.S., the U.S. is so good at chain restaurants. And when <laughs> yeah. I first moved here. All I did was go to Cheesecake Factory and Applebee's and my my goodness, Texas Roadhouse. And I went to all these places that we didn't have in Canada. And that's why, like, when that first photo shoot came up, I was like, I'm not ready for this. I've been eating. <laughs> True story. I never I'd never been to a steak and shake in my life. So when I moved to Cleveland, there's a steak and shake at Steel Yard Commons, you know, very close to where I lived. And I was like, hold on, you're telling me these five meals are $5? <laughs> like, I'm going to take three of them. And that's what I did because I was so blown away. Another quick story. I had some friends come visit me from Canada, came down to watch a Browns game. And I said, oh, let's go somewhere quick. We went to Applebee's and they had like the two for 20 deal, which is two entrees and an appetizer for 20 bucks. Yep. And my friends are like, hold on like most people get that for two people like that 20 bucks for all this food i'm gonna get one for myself and all my friends got a two for 20 for themselves <laughs> because it was such an incredibly good deal i sound like y'all had to get another whole another table with all that food <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the thing that took the most getting used to was you know so many options in the u.s the other thing is like what cell phone provider do i want to go with there's like 17 of them to choose from <laughs> Yeah, but only like three of them actually work. <laughs> so, also, right. I, I remember. <laughs> I remember when I, I think I moved on a I moved on a Sunday, and I'm like, oh, I need some groceries. So I went down to I went down to Steel Yard Commons again. I went to the Walmart there, and I like filled up my cart with all this different stuff, and I went to buy beer, and they were like, we can't sell that to you, and I'm like, ha ha, like very funny. Don't worry, I'm 21, and they said, no, we can't sell it to you. I'm like, what? I said it's a Sunday. I went, what? And I guess that was a thing. You can't, you couldn't at that time buy alcohol on a Sunday. What? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's hard to explain that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, the that fact was that I was buying beer like, at, a, at a Walmart you know, or God, grocery It was store. God's day or something like that. It's just like, hey, you know, on God's day, there, there should be no sale of alcohol or something like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I remember reading that in the book of Deuteronomy. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, uh, I heard you talking about fishing earlier, and I know, I see that you you know you're a former amateur winner of the uh, Northern Bass uh, Open. Do you still fish here in Ohio? 
I haven't been back to Ohio. Well, I, I guess I was there about a year ago. I was living in Cincinnati right before moving here to Los Angeles. Lake Erie was right there at my you know doorstep. And when I was living in Cleveland, I was living downtown. And for Lake Erie to be right there, right. I've been fishing my whole life. So it, it just made sense that I had to do some fishing in Lake Erie, which is some of the best smallmouth bass fishing in the world. And that prize that you were just talking about, Too Cold, was actually out of Sandusky, Ohio. So I was right. in a tournament out of Sandusky and yeah, I caught this massive smallmouth, six pounds, seven ounces, biggest smallmouth I've ever caught in my life. And I won't, I won't go off on too much of a tangent here. But, uh, <laughs> hey, do your thing, man. Do your thing. But my love of bass fishing uh, made me create this bass fishing brand that I have with my fishing partner. Woo! Tungsten. We sell yeah. tungsten fishing weights for bass fishing. We've had it now for five years and I love bass fishing. It is my one of my early passions one of my early loves in life. And I love that I've been able to take my love of fishing and turn it into a business, which we're really proud of what we've built with it. Well, speaking of your love of fishing and, you know, things you like to do, I want to ask you another question. What's one thing about Chris Van Vliet, man, CBB? What is one thing that you enjoy doing that we or anybody else might not necessarily expect from you? The bass fishing, I think, surprises people a lot, especially when you see photos like that one down there where I'm like wearing a tuxedo and like, you know, all dressed up red carpet style. It's so juxtaposed, right? Like the red carpet suits and ties and tuxedos is so juxtaposed from like owning a pickup truck and a bass boat, which I did for many, many years. So I think that's one. I think the other is that I play guitar. I don't, I think a lot of people don't realize that I play guitar. I've been playing since I was in high school, I was in a band in college. So I think that that surprises a lot of people. Okay. I'm gonna add, oh, go ahead, Tuko. I, I just had to, I wanted to bring it back to wrestling real quick. And I just, I, I have to bring this up, man. The infamous uh, red meat chest. I, you, you, <laughs> what was it like? I, 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 well, I don't even know if I could ask what was it like, because obviously uh, the evidence was there. But for you, you know, to be able to partake in something like that and to take that on, what was that like to, to take that many uh, slaps to the chest? And what was it like for you afterwards? So I'll tell you the full story here. So I had interviewed Sean Spears right after he was released from WWE, right before he signed with AEW. Right. And he just started his wrestling school with Tyler Breeze, Flatbacks, which is one of the best wrestling schools in America. So if you're in the central Florida area and you're looking for a wrestling school, Flatbacks is the place to go. So he said, I'd love to have you come down to Flatbacks. I said, great. Yeah, I'll come take some bumps. We'll make a YouTube video out of it. Perfect. Yeah, I used to train. I can run the ropes, take some bumps. Can't really do much else, but I'll do that. <laughs> so we set it up. I get there. I meet all the students. They're great they're like sponges like taking in all this knowledge and information and i'm seeing them put it to work as i'm watching their training session and so i say to spears i say all right well i'll go in there i'll take some bumps i'll run the ropes maybe we'll lock it up a little bit maybe you can give me a scoop slam he goes well at the end how about i uh give you a chop and i'm like yeah i mean sure i'll i'll take a chop that's that's not very exciting to take one chop i said <laughs> Why don't we up the ante here? Why don't we line up all your students and have all your students chop me? And he's like, oh, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, why, why not? Sure, what the heck? So we started the video and I was bumping. As you see, I ran the ropes, locked it up. And then we went into the chops. And I didn't realize this, that at, that at Flatbacks, everybody gets two chops. So I started doing yeah. the math really quick in my head. There's eight students, there's two teachers, 10 times two. Oh my God, I'm gonna take 20 chops. <laughs> And I swear to you guys, after about the, I don't know, fifth or sixth chop, my chest just went numb. Like it just completely numb. Like it still stung a little bit, but just numb. And when I started to take the chops from Spears and Breeze and they were so loud and so hard, I feel like the numbness maybe went away for a second because I definitely felt those ones, but I knew it was entertaining. It was fun. Those guys are such sweethearts that at no point was I ever in any sort of danger, which I think some people are like, oh, how, how could they possibly do that to you? <laughs> right. I brought it on myself. I asked for this <laughs> to happen. I don't know if I would do it again, but I'm proud of the fact that I did it. 
did you at any point did you know if your heart stopped beating i mean obviously <laughs> you didn't die and fall over so but would, did you at least check to make sure you were still beating it probably stopped about 20 times like every time i took a chop it probably stopped <laughs> i don't think i'll be at uh, double or nothing this weekend uh you know even though i'm very excited for AEW having a show with full crowd very excited mm -hmm. that they're going to pack daily's place i think that's we're definitely trending in the right direction but no, I, I'm not planning to fly into Jacksonville. I'm on the other coast right now. If I still lived in uh, Miami, which I did for many years, I would definitely drive up there. But yeah, I'm just gonna be watching uh, like everybody else. Last last little question before I pass it to franchise. Did you happen to catch a uh, backlash last night? I did not, and I think I'm glad okay. I did. Okay. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> I was gonna get your thoughts on. I think the nights. correct title is WrestleMania Backlash. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> I, see here, here, here at Generation Rap, we refuse to call it that because it's always been backlash. It, it's never, it was never no point of calling it WrestleMania backlash. But I, I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on the whole zombie uh, lumberjack thing, I, if you had saw it. But no, you, I you haven't seen it yet. So. I have just seen the tweets about it. I don't know. Maybe I should remain in the dark on this one. I, okay. <laughs> you know what? Not yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're Why were that. there zombies? They were advertising the uh, Army of Dead movie, you know. Yeah, the Zack Snyder film. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So, and Batista was doing the uh, narrating for the introduction. So, you know, they were kind of incorporating that, and I guess that was their big surprise or whatever for the show. But yeah, it, it yeah, it was, yeah. Well, you know, it's, there's going to be some sort of time in three or five or eight years from now when one of those zombies becomes like a massive star in like yep. <laughs> maybe WWE, maybe AEW. And we're going to go back to that and go, ah, you know, like, like that MJF moment with uh, Samoa Joe in the hallway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to be that. <laughs> one of these are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. So Fred Chris, is. so Chris, I want to, I want to, I want to bring it to you and your podcast and uh, your uh, YouTube channel. So right now it seems like these days, everybody including us are kind of on the you know, podcasting way, but you've been doing it really before it became what it is now, especially, you know, during, you know, this time now where everybody's kind of been trapped in the house for the last year, year and a half. Everybody's running the social media, running the YouTube, just trying to kill time. When did you realize you could make a decent living out of this? And when did you understand how important uh, your brand was really starting to become, especially amongst the wrestling community? I mean, I still don't know if I really have figured that part out, but I think my, so my YouTube channel started in 2011, kind of by accident, if I'm being completely honest. So I was doing these great interviews while I was working in Cleveland and I was doing these interviews with these massive celebrities and we would air like one little segment of it on TV and that was it. And I thought, man, I, that's just, it's awful that if you're a huge fan of this person, the only time you would see this interview is if you happen to be watching channel 19 at 4.24 PM on that Thursday, that's it. You know, and obviously the clip would then be on WOIO.com, but right. I thought, man, well, what if I could just take these interviews and put them on my YouTube channel just so they could live somewhere? And that's where my right. YouTube channel really began. It's like, I've been doing these big interviews, like <clears throat> at the time there were interviews with like the, the stars of the Twilight movies, the stars of the Hunger Game movies, interviews that were getting millions of views. Right. So that's where my YouTube channel started. And then someone's like, you know, you can make money on this thing. And I went, what? <laughs> I was just, I just thought it was cool collecting these views. They said, oh yeah, you just click this button. There's like this thing called AdSense. You fill out a form. I went, huh? I didn't know you could make money on this thing. And so I guess early on, like I think it was like 2012, I monetized my account. So that was, it was early on when I realized you could make some sort of money. But it wasn't until 2018 when I really started like putting in the effort and going, oh, there's some like real money to be made here if I start to really put some effort into this. And at the time, I did my wrestling interviews were really starting to gain some sort of traction. I was being able to, you know, I was really fortunate. I had access because of where I was working to get access to these people who, uh, you know, didn't maybe give a lot of interviews. I was able to interview The Miz a bunch of times, Dolph Ziggler a bunch of times. Anytime wrestling was in town, I would do an yep. interview. Right. And then I started to go, well, what if I went out of my way to do these interviews? I think that could really help. So I started like driving out of town. <clears throat> maybe an hour, two or three, or if I was like flying to LA for a different interview, I would tack on like, which wrestlers live in LA? Let's see if we can do an interview here. And that's when it really started to grow. So 2018, I really started to go out of my way. My goal that year was to do 
I think my, my goal that year was to do 40 wrestling interviews. And up, up to that point, I think the most I'd ever done was like 20 or 18 or something like that. I ended up doing 50 that year. So the, the goal the next year was, let's see if I can do 50. I ended up doing 100 in 2019. And it was just like, okay, well, I can see that there's some momentum behind this. And I just kind of kept rolling with it. So, man, it's been a lot of fun. I, I love having these types of conversations. So I figure if I can just put a camera up there and record it and share it with some fellow fans, everybody wins then. What's the craziest interview you ever, uh, you didn't plan for, but you, 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 it happened to fall into your lap? I've had a few, actually. That's a great question. Like, I've had a few where someone has been friends of somebody and says, hey, would you ever be interested in interviewing so-and-so? And I'm like, yeah, for sure. So, like, one of them was Austin Aries, who mm. a, a, a mutual friend connected us, and then he ended up giving me a call and said, all right, man, here's all the things I want to talk about. And I went, this is going to be great. All right, I'll fly to Las Vegas and we'll do this. And he right. goes, oh, well, where are you planning to stay? I'm like, I don't know. I'll figure it out when I get there. He goes, well, would you like to stay at my house? I'm like, uh, okay, sure. <laughs> so I, I, I have to give it to Austin Aries. He was such a hospitable host and such a kind man who cooked dinner for me and we, had, we drank wine together. It was very, very kind of him. So that was one that fell into my lap completely unexpected. That is the longest interview I've done on my YouTube channel and podcast at almost two hours. He covered so many topics and I feel like we still have so much more to cover. So there might be another one. So that was one that definitely, definitely surprised me. Speaking of interviews, what is one interview you haven't gotten a chance to do yet, but it's still on your bucket list? And it could be either on the Hollywood side or the wrestling side of things. Who is one person you must have before it's all said and done? I keep saying Vince McMahon. And I mean, I think that if, if this is, if you're a wrestling fan, I think you, you have to want to yeah. talk to Vince McMahon. I just want to, I want to, I want to talk to Vince McMahon, the person, like I want to talk to Vince McMahon, the entrepreneur. I don't yeah. want to just ask him wrestling questions. Like I'm really curious, like what makes him tick? What's his workout routine look like? Like, what does he eat for <laughs> breakfast? Like these are things we don't know about Vince McMahon. He, yeah. for everything that we do know about him in the wrestling world, Yes. He's such an enigma when it comes to his personal life. So I'd love to just like sit down and like have like a three hour just in-depth conversation with him. I don't know that it's going to happen, but I will keep putting it out into the world. That's the best way to do it. Uh, any <clears throat> any little uh, tips to give up and coming people who are doing podcasts and interviewers, not to give away too much of your trade secret, you know, you know, because what works for you, you know, works for you. But it, it, anything to kind of, you know, you know, to give to those who are you know, looking to do this? There's no secrets here. Like, I, I, don't, I don't have any <laughs> secrets. So I'll tell you everything. Uh, uh, I, I think the, the biggest thing is you actually have to start. And congratulations right. to you guys on actually Thanks. starting. And I think Thank that you. there's so many people out there that talk about starting a podcast and talk about starting a YouTube channel. And then they put too much time into like, okay, well, do I have the right camera? Do I have the right microphone? Do I have the right name for it? Just start. So I think yeah. number one is, you just have to start and then figure it out as you go. And I'm sure that you guys would agree with me that your first, you know, bunch of episodes were probably not your best work right. and you're learning as you're going. So I think that that's a really important thing. If you're talking about just interviews in general, there's a quote from the late, great Larry King who said, I never learned anything by talking. And it's such a good point of like, if you want to be a great interviewer, be a great listener. And yeah. I think that that's a really important thing. Like, listen to what your guest is saying <laughs> instead of thinking in your mind about the next thing that you're going to talk about. Be present in that moment. And that's just right. good life advice. Be, pr be present in that moment and appreciate the moment as it's happening. So there's a couple, you know, really quick things right there. And I think that also just, just do it. Like, continue to do it. Be consistent with it. If you're going to have a podcast or a YouTube channel, set a day. Say, yeah. we're going to do this every Tuesday, or we're going to do this every Tuesday and Thursday or whatever, and then stick to it and be consistent with it. And don't make excuses. You know, mm -hmm. no matter where you are in the world, no matter what's going on in your life, stick to that schedule and make it happen. Well, it's funny you said that because, you know, growing up with my father, we used to, my dad, like, unlike most parents would listen to music, he would just sit there and listen to talk radio all day, every day, all day, every day. And it's funny because now that I have children of my own, I find myself when I'm at the gym, I listen to music initially, 
but then I'll put on a really good podcast. I really yeah. just get lost in the power Same, of conversation. Yeah. And, and it's funny because you, like you said, to become a great pod, you know, podcast host or host, you have to be a great listener. And I think it's amazing how, even if you're a kid and you're around the adults and they're having their conversation at the table and you're not supposed to be listening, but you're kind of just eavesdropping is really awesome. And you really can learn a lot just by listening to other people yeah. and watching your interview. I don't even know how I came across your page a couple of years ago, but I did. I'm like, Whoa, this dude is cool. Like I remember you from like, obviously channel 19, but when I found out that you had a wrestling podcast, it's like, okay, this guy goes not just from WWE, but he goes to TNA. He goes to the underground companies. And then I seen you interview, you know, celebrities as well. And just the poise and the polish you have, it's, you kind of really balance the, you know, that line between professionalism and still being yourself. And I like, you know, that's kind of our model where we have fun. We try to keep it professional, but at the same time, you know, it's, we have our bullet points, but then it's like you said, man, we kind of really let the conversation flow. So I want to ask you this. When did you really, really realize you were good at this? Like, when was this like, OK, you know what? If nothing else ever works again, I will always at least have a career in this. Oh, I feel like I'm still figuring that out as we <laughs> go. But I remember being like early in my career and I was I was working for MTV2 Canada and we were interviewing some big celebrities and some big musicians. And I remember we'd have a 10 or 15 minute interview and I would be able to have like th three or four solid questions, three or four solid moments. And you could just edit those moments and make this great package. It, you know, a package is like a three ish minute, like segment that would air on TV. And I remember, um, our sister station, much, much music was airing the raw interviews on their website on much.com and i went oh my god i'd be terrified if someone put my full interviews up like my if my raw interviews were put online i'd be so embarrassed so um sure we can do another interview with jd why not yeah people people were very mad when i interviewed jd last time though but <laughs> yeah, i don't care i want to talk to anybody who has a great story so i i think in, it was in that moment when i went an interview needs to be a consistently good piece of work or piece of art, if you will. And I think that the way that I was looking at it was like, I need to go in and get my sound bites and then get out. And I started treating interviews more as a conversation in that moment. So that definitely changed things for me when I started looking at them as conversations instead of interviews with a capital I. And I think that a lot of people yeah. freak themselves out when they, yeah. when they go into an interview, they're like, oh my God, it's an interview. <laughs> Whereas if all three of us bumped into each other you know, and had a beer tonight, we wouldn't be like, oh my God. So, okay, too cold just said this. Okay, so I'm going to ask him this. And then when he's done with that, I'm going to say this to Franchise. No, you don't do that in a real life right. conversation. So, right, right. the second I made that shift from interview to conversation, I think that that's when things really changed. I also realized that the interview begins when you walk into the room, or in the case of a virtual interview, the second that the camera pops up. And yes. I think that there's too many people, and I've seen them do this where, <clears throat> They don't, they don't set the tone. They don't build the rapport early on. And I think I realized that early on when I was doing these celebrity interviews where they sit in a hotel room all day doing 50 yeah. interviews or something like that. And a new journalist just rotates in every four or five minutes. I wanted to do something that made myself stand out. Like I wanted to like bring big energy from the second I walked in that door. Hopefully they would match my energy and then have a really high energetic, like funny, conversations so that was something that i also did really early on mm. awesome. speaking of wanting to ask vince what he eats for breakfast chris what did you eat for breakfast this morning <laughs> wow man you guys are coming with a tough questions here come on i'm uh i i kind of do like a double breakfast thing right now so within the first hour of waking up i'll have a protein shake a banana and then like some sort of a carb and peanut butter. And then I'll eat an actual breakfast a few hours after that, which is eggs and some oatmeal and some sort of something green, maybe some spinach or something like that. Chris, I've been checking out your social media. I see uh, you were just in the gym uh, about a week or so ago, I, I believe, uh, with the bodybuilder, man, pretty jacked guy. I see you getting your swole on yourself, man. What's your workout routine, brother? 
Yeah, I was in the gym with Quincy Whittington, who's a professional bodybuilder, and he made yeah. me feel like I was a minuscule human. <laughs> uh, I was about to say, like, how did you, how did that work out for you? Seeing a, him he's a do big his dude. You doing yours? Yeah, he's five seven and two hundred and thirty pounds. He's a beast. <laughs> A beast of a man. He's only uh, my workout seven? routine right now is pretty simple. I'm on a, I'm on a three day split. So uh, push, pull, and then shoulders and legs. So chest and tries, back and buys, and then shoulders and legs with abs thrown in. Uh, it's very nice, Adam Cole Bay Bay. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed that conversation with Nick. That was so, and I did it in person, which was really cool to be able to do that in person here in LA. Too cold. Uh, you know. I it, well, this has just been awesome to talk with you. Uh, just kind of pick your brain a little bit, hear some cool stories. Oh, uh, I've loved this. Is there any? Um, I, well, I, honestly, I, what, what's next for Chris Van Lee? What's what's next on you know for you interview wise? Who you know? Well, you know, I, I don't know if you want to say who, but uh, is there someone next on your list that you're getting you're getting ready for? Yeah, sure. I can tell you a whole bunch of my interviews that are coming up here. <laughs> The, my, the whole thing about my podcast is I love talking to interesting people. Yeah, there's a lot of wrestlers in there because I'm a big wrestling fan, but oh, sure. But I also want to talk to people who are the best at what they do. And that's why the show is called Insight, because I selfishly want to take some insight from their life and apply it to right. my own. And you know, then anybody listening can apply it to their own life. So I uh, just finished an interview right before we started this one. Fascinating conversation with a guy who retired at 35. His name is Steve Adcock. And it's a, an idea about like early retirement and like financial independence. And I'm not saying everybody can retire at 35, but just fascinating right. being able to pick his brain and like learn about like what we can do. So that one's coming up. But in terms of the wrestling world, I, I got a list here. I'll pull up, we'll pull up my list of my uh, interviews that are coming up here. Awesome. Chuck Palumbo. I just did, did an interview oh, with wow. him. Xavier Woods is going to be on the show. Awesome. And Eddie Guerrero's daughter, Shaw Guerrero, is going to be on the show. Uh, sure and awesome. UFC fighter Sean O'Malley is also going to be on with us. Whew, huge lineup, huge lineup, brother. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about all of these. And then, you know, the, the thing, and you guys know this, the thing is, once you've lined up a few, those come and go real quick. So now it's time to, you got to line up some more after that. Most yeah. Uh, <clears throat> last little quick thing here. I'm sorry. Last little quick thing here uh, to kind of on the funny side. Uh, so Floyd Mayweather and Logan Paul. Uh, <laughs> are you are you interested in seeing this? Are you are you going to watch the, the shenanigans with the rest of us and yeah. and yeah. see what goes down? Yeah, we're all going to watch, and that's the beauty of it. This is this is the best example of like some of the best work that's going on in pro wrestling right now. That's not actually going on in pro wrestling. Like uh, they are they. Logan Paul is working everybody. I was Logan just going to ask you a shoot or a work. Oh, this is this is a total work. Like, and, and the thing is, I think what's crazy about it is Logan Paul and Jake Paul are not great boxers. Maybe they're better than us three. Sure, great. And they've been training with some, you know, top people. Awesome. Are they, you know, are they going to be good against actual boxers? Hell no, of course not. But <laughs> They both created these huge heel personas for themselves that everybody just wants to see Jake and Logan get their ass beat. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a good chance of that with Floyd. Uh, so seeing that, do you see Jake? Uh, I believe it's Jake he's fighting. Uh, it's Logan. The, he's fighting. It's Logan. 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 Okay. I, how how far do you see Logan going? Do you see him making it? I, I know Floyd's not known for his knockout, but you just said it. So do we see him going long the whole seven or eight rounds that they may go? Or do you see a quick knockout in the first three? And look, I understand why you might think it's Jake that's fighting him because for some reason, Jake's the one who's at the forefront. Just, of his see, right. He's always the one in the news. <laughs> right. Although, isn't he? I hear he's banned from the fight because yeah, of all the is. stupid stuff he's doing. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I Look, you, you nailed it on the head. Floyd is one of the, look, obviously one of the greatest boxers of all time. That's, I right. can't even argue that. But he might be the best defensive boxer of all yeah. time without arguments. So, you're right. I don't know if we're going to see a knockout, especially because he's that much smaller than Logan. Right. This fight is for entertainment. So if right. it goes all eight rounds, I think we're going to be thoroughly entertained. At least I hope that we're going to be thoroughly <laughs> entertained. And I think we're the thriller does a really good job, top to bottom, with their pay-per-views, just putting on a show that's like fascinating and entertaining to watch. So I think we all know who's going to win this fight. I mean, <laughs> can't see any circumstance or any scenario where Floyd Mayweather loses this. No, no, but no. I think that if Floyd Mayweather stopped that fight with Conor McGregor, I think we see something like that happen. Mm. Chris, Franchise. before we get off here, man, because we definitely want to respect your time. 
So you have this saying, and I'm going I'm to regurgitate it back to you. Vague goals gives vague results. So with that being said, closed mouths don't get fed. So here we go. For our listeners on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, everywhere, I'm going to ask you to put us over as best you can in the audio tag. <laughs> Only thing we ask of you is to include the name Generation Wrestling Podcast. So I want to put your amateur wrestling skills to use. Go shoot for it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I couldn't. I haven't cut a promo in like 19 years or something like that. Hold on yeah. really quick. Adam Cole says you're the GOAT, so that means you got it. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, thank you, Adam Cole. Bay Bay. <laughs> I feel like I need to like get back into like Chris Sharp mode here. That was my backyard wrestling guy, Chris Sharp. Chris Sharp. Yeah. But I will say that if you're looking for the best wrestling content and the best interviews on all of YouTube and in anywhere where you can listen to this, you need to listen to Generation of Wrestling with Too Cold and Franchise. Why? Because it is the best uh thank you, you. Know, the great, thank the great you. thing about wrestling promos you could literally say anything but as long as you just speak slowly right. an emotion look right Gotta have that into emotion. the camera that's all you need to do hey look we just got I'm put sorry. over by chris van i don't know about I'm you guys sorry. man but i'm good i'm good i felt that in my spirit right i'm like oh man we feel like i, I was this guy a for a bit. second yeah i was that guy that's all i chris, had to channel that guy that's all right all you need was the shades baby Last thing. So, Leo, and I can't bring it up right here. Uh, it's a little far in the comments, but he asked, there's a belt right behind you. He wants to know if we could possibly get a close up and explain that story, man. Oh, yeah. Of how of you got it. Let's grab it here. Here we go. This is the uh, Chris Van Vleet Show Championship, even though the show's not called that anymore. <laughs> This was made, it's a custom belt from Fandu Belts. Awesome. Who, Fandu, I mean, they make some incredible replica championships. They have the best big gold on the market. But uh, yeah, this is, uh, this was a lovely gift. It's beautiful. Yeah, they did such a nice job with it. So, and the inside is this beautiful red crocodile. Oh, that's nice. I like that. Undisputed champ. The champ deserves best. You know, you got to give him the champion the best. So there you go. I'll just put it on my chest. And everyone, everyone's always asking me. Everyone's always asking me, are you going to put that title on the line? Well, damn right. I'll put this title on the line anytime, anywhere against someone named Chris Van Vliet. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Chris, I definitely want to tell you, man, you definitely are killing the 24-7 championship by a million. So <laughs> I will I agree. This is a much better looking championship uh, than that. Way, I mean. way better. Way more prestige. Way more prestige. Well, Chris, man, too cold. Before we get off the air, is there any last thing you want to ask Chris before we get off of here? No, man. Again, just appreciate you taking the time out to talk with us, man. You know, and just kind of have a laugh. And I this was awesome. Uh definitely appreciate it. And uh yeah, man. I, I'm excited, man. <laughs> so I'm good. I appreciate you guys having me on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. <laughs> there it <you> goes. <laughs> Book it. Book it. <laughs> there it is. Double or nothing, baby. That's the buy-in. Well, the name needs to be Chris Van Vliet to challenge for the Chris Van Vliet Championship. You heard him, Leo. He said Chris Van Vliet. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for tuning in to another episode of Generation Wrestling Podcast. As always, it's yours truly, the 27-year-old piece of gold. He's too cold. He's Chris Van Vliet, a.k.a. CVB. Chris, before we get off the air, please drop all your social medias, all your handles, uh, websites. Can you do that for us, please? Yeah, guys, thank you so much for having me on. This was so much fun. I really appreciate you. you. Wherever you're listening to this right now, you can listen to my podcast, Insight with Chris Van Vliet. I listed off a few of the guests that we got coming up, and I'm very excited about that. You can find me on social media at Chris Van Vliet, V-A-N-V-L-I-E-T. And that's it. I hope you guys have a great day. Like, Be great and be grateful. All right, thank most you. And Leo says, what about the big announcement? Leo, the big announcement is the GOW. We officially have come out with our new merch today, which will be available print to order. So, you know, we had to make sure you guys checked out Chris Van Vliet. We didn't want to bring it up too early in the show, but it's not about us. It's about him. We'll talk about this later. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time out to join us. Hope to hear from you soon. And God bless, brother. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you.